Well, you can't hunt with that cartridge because that is a military cartridge. It was specifically designed for the military. Really? <laughs> I don't think so. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors and today we are going to cover military cartridges used for hunting. Because there are some folks out there who have told me you can't use a military cartridge like a 2234 deer hunting because obviously that was designed for warfare and it's not going to work on deer. Well, too many people have used it on too many deer to disprove that theory. And there are several other cartridges that will also disprove it. For instance, have you ever heard of the 30-06? <laughs> that was developed for the military, and it is one of the most respected and successful hunting cartridges in the world. Ditto the 308 Winchester. <laughs> <laughs> the small child that sprang from the 30 six, And that is wonderfully effective. So this idea that designing and cartridge specifically for the military means it's off limits for hunting is sort of silly. 4570 was a military cartridge that's a successful hunting cartridge. You can just go on down the list. And we're going to do part of that list today with some of the popular cartridges from the military that spun off into a hunting world during the 20th century, specifically World War I and World War II. So that's what we have on the table is a partial selection of the Allied and Axis powers cartridges used in the wars. Not all of them are here because there were Portuguese cartridges and Italian cartridges and Greek cartridges and just about every country had its own cartridge. But they also would arm themselves with rifles from their associates um, because they had more production, they had more rifles available, more ammunition. It got pretty mixed up. I mean, we actually ended up building rifles for the Soviets chambering for their cartridges for a time. So did the Brits and all around the world, things got pretty mixed up. But as a general rule, we're gonna cover the cartridges that were pretty well the standards for the Allies versus the Axis, and then figure out which ones are adaptable for hunting. And some of them obviously like the 30-06 are a fantastic hunting cartridge. Some of them are a little bit more obscure. So let's dive right in. First of all, we're going with the old standard the 8 by 57 Mauser. This was created in 1888 by the German Military Commission for their official war cartridge. They modified it in 1905 by going to a wider bullet. So it started out with a 0.318 inch diameter bullet. They changed it to 0.323. So figure it is a 32 caliber. And you can see uh, up against the uh, good old 30 out 6 for a comparison, same body shape diameter, same head diameter, just a little bit shorter on the 857. So it's going to be a little bit less powder, a little bit slower. Then we go to the Japanese 6.5 by 50 millimeter Arasaka, or it's often called in the reloading manuals, the 6.5 Jap. And that one is quite a bit smaller, and it's one of the 6.5s which were really popular with a lot of militaries. There was a 6.5 French cartridge, a Greek, um, Dutch, German. I mean, there were just a bunch of 6.5s out there. But this was the one that was used the most in World War II, and it makes for a fairly reasonable hunting cartridge, although you don't see it nearly as much as the 30 6 obviously, or even the 857 Mauser. Now, the British, joining uh, the Allies, used the 303 British. This is an old cartridge, and this one also goes back to 1980 or 1888. It is a 311 inch diameter bullet, 0 0.311. So it's fairly different from the 30 out 6 in that regard. Plus, you can see it has a smaller and more tapered case, so there's less powder in it. It's not going to be going quite as fast. But this became a really successful and popular hunting cartridge all around the world because the British Empire spanned the globe. Think from Australia to Canada to India. In Africa, this got used a lot. And it's still a really popular moose round up in Canada. So in order to compare these for their ability as a hunting cartridge, I think we need to 
understand exactly what bullets we can shoot in them. We're not going to be shooting the full jacketed military style bullets. We're going to shoot soft points and hollow points and, and plastic tip bullets of various stripes for hunting. So consider that. But I want to give you some data on the original bullets that were used in the uh, muzzle velocities that were generated. And part of the reason is going to be because of the acceptable pressures. I didn't get exact pressures on all of these, but your max chamber pressure is going to make a big difference. And we're going to see which ones are which in these military cartridges before we move up to the potential for modern rifles and cartridges. Let me grab the computer and get my list off of it. Now, the 6.5x55, this little guy right here, the Jap, 1897 is when they came up with that thing, and it shot a 139 grain bullet at 2,500 feet per second. That's fairly low, and it's because they had roughly a 40,000 PSI max chamber pressure. That's quite low. The 30 out 6 was 60,000 PSI, so you can see a significant difference there. This is roughly the performance you could expect from today's 6.5 Grendel. Maybe even a little less than that, but we'll look at some numbers here fairly soon. Now, what I don't have here is another round that the Japanese used during World War II. I don't know which one they had more of, the 6.5 or this one, but this you may not have heard of. It was not familiar to me. It's a 7.7 .7 by 58 millimeter Jap or Arasaka. That came out in 1939, so they were gearing up for World War II with this one. It shot 175 grain bullet at 2,400 feet per second, and that one had roughly 42,000 PSI of pressure. The 303 British in 88, I already said, that shot 175 grain ball, meaning round, full metal jacketed tip bullet, uh, 2,440 feet per second. Now we're getting our PSIs up there a little more, 52,939 PSI. The 857 Mauser was a 154 grain bullet at 2,880 feet per second, but I was surprised at this. They had 35,000 PSI. I think they may have meant cup, copper units of pressure, a different way of measuring the pressure by crushing a copper pellet. Uh, the SAMI specs for it these days, 56,560. So it's getting right up there as well. The 30 out 6, I already mentioned that one was 60,000 PSI. That shoots, uh, in, during the wars, we were shooting 150 grain bullet mainly at 2,800 feet per second. In World War II, that would have been in the Garand M1, and I think they reduced it down to 2,700 feet per second, probably because of the function of that rifle and the push rod that was driven back to cycle it. You could bend them with too much pressure. Um, then we have a couple here that I just not don't have samples of, and one is the Russian cartridge. Remember, they were our ally in World War II. 7.62 by 53 millimeter Russian cartridge came out in 1891. It was in the Mosin Nagant bolt action rifles. It shot 147 grain bullet at 2,886 feet per second with 45,000 PSI of pressure. Again, pretty light loads. And I think they made those light loads back in those military rifles in those days, both because they weren't maybe that sure of the quality of the steel for containing the pressures, plus considering all the mud and debris and things that can go wrong, why push the envelope? You just want a, a gun that's going to keep firing, not something that's going to be on the edge of perhaps blowing up. Then the Soviets, during the war, they switched to the 762 by 39 That's that short one in the AK-47s that some folks are familiar with. They, I don't think, used too many of those because they didn't come out with them until 1943. So they probably didn't see nearly as much use as you would imagine. But that one was an originally shooting 122 grain bullet at 2,329 feet per second, 51,490 PSIs of pressure. And of course, that one is pretty popular today because of all the military rifles and uh, such that are out there and the lookalikes. So that gives you an idea of what was going on in the 20th century, World War I, World War II, right in that time span. Now, let us consider this as a legitimate collection of hunting cartridges. Obviously, if the Grendel is used for whitetail hunting and it's matching up fairly well with this little Arasaka, we've got what we need for some deer hunting at least. Can we go 
more than that. Obviously, we know we can with the 30 out 6. Let's visit the rest of these. Drop drifts and all the usual here. We're going to upgrade to modern bullets. So on this first one, the 6.5x50, the Arasaka 129 grain bullet. Um, I pulled this one out of the Hornady catalog. I don't remember the exact bullet, but they had a BC rating of 0.485, which is pretty high. You usually get a pretty high bullet rating um, BC with the 6.5s. The muzzle velocity, you could safely push that to 2,600 feet per second. Not as fast as you might be able to drive it if you could trust the rifles. And this is a big concern with all of these 20th century military rifles. In some cases, they had the latest technology and the best steels and construction and everything else to make some pretty strong rifles that could withstand some pressures. But the fact that they held those pressures pretty low as we've already covered, suggests that even they didn't want to risk blowing things up and maybe they would. So I don't think you ever want to push the envelope on some of these old things. Another thing that I came up with in my research was that during the war, production often got sloppy and they also started using some fairly inferior materials to build some of their rifles toward the end of the war. They just had to get something out there that would shoot even if it wasn't of the highest quality. So if you're getting surplus or you find something in grandpa's attic that he brought back from the war or something like that, you cannot necessarily trust it. So get anything and everything checked out by a gunsmith to make sure that there's no serious flaws with it. Do a little research on the guns themselves and be prepared to be shooting fairly light loads in some of these. But with this uh, Arasaka, a lot of guys brought those back and they have been fairly successfully used for deer hunting. So you can expect with this bullet I just mentioned at 2,600 feet per second to get about 1,937 foot-pounds of energy. More than enough for a deer or even an elk. But that's at the muzzle, what's going to happen downrange. So your recoil in a seven pound rifle is gonna be pretty light, 12.5 foot pounds of it, that's nice. Maximum point blank range for a six inch target, 265 yards, not bad. So at 100 yards, you're 2.9 inches high. You're drifting in a 10 mile an hour right angle wind about 0.8 of an inch and you're down to 1,679 foot-pounds of energy. At 200 yards, you're still 1.3 inches high, three inches of deflection in the wind, 1,449 foot-pounds of remaining energy. Boy, that's still pretty good. If we say elk, you want 1,500, you're right close to that, so should be more than enough for deer. And that's even with that low pressure. 300 yards, you're dropping 7.2 inches, got the same uh, amount of drift, and you're down to 1,244. So even out to 300 yards, you've got more than enough energy for what we consider a useful deer cartridge. Pretty nice stuff. And again, as I mentioned, 6.5, matching up fairly well with the Grendel. Think Creedmoor, you're going to get a little more velocity out of that Creedmoor. You can get 2750 with a 129 grain bullet. You're probably looking at 2850 to 2900. So definitely an improvement with the Creedmoor. Now the 7.7 uh, .7 by 58, which we don't have on the table, but it wouldn't look that much different from this or this. In fact, it's pretty much matching up with that 303 British. We're going to shoot a 150 grain bullet. The BC is 0.361, muzzle velocity 2,700 feet per second, muzzle energy 2,428. A little more recoil out of this one, 17.8 foot-pounds, maximum point blank range 260 yards. So it's hanging right in there. Um, but what the problem is with these is this is one of those problem rifles where they got a little bit sloppy as they went further down the road. And also it shot a 0.311 inch diameter bullet and the bores were not necessarily all precise. They might have gone a little bit sloppy and gone to 0.312 or a little bit tighter to 310. So you kind of have to be careful about this stuff. At any rate, look at the numbers and you'll see the improvement um, in energies over the 6.5 because obviously you're gonna have heavier bullet here. So, uh, you know, not a lot of difference at 100 yards. You look at your 200 yard chart, not a lot of difference there. A little more energy, maybe 200 foot pounds. Uh, a little more drop actually out at 300, just a slight difference in the drop there. A little more wind deflection because you don't have that highly efficient bu uh, BC bullet anymore. But you're still keeping your energies about 100 foot pounds above the lighter bullet out of the 6.5. 
303 British, again, you're shooting a 0.311 inch diameter bullet. I have not heard reports that they got sloppy with their bores or chambers on this one, so they're pretty consistent. And you've got to use the 311 bullet, not a 308. You start to load a 308 inch diameter bullet in there, and you're probably not going to seal up as well in the deeper um, uh, grooves of your rifling. Um, so stick with that 311 bullet. Not as many around to pick from, but Hornady has some, and I'm sure some of the other manufacturers have a 0.311 inch diameter bullet. 150 grains. Again, you're matched up with that Arisaka with the 0.361. Got a little more velocity out of this one because of the higher pressures allowed, 2,750. The upshot is you got smidgen more uh, recoil energy. You got a little more reach, 10 yards, more maximum point blank range reach. And look again at your numbers, 100 and 200 yards, not a huge difference, but some. And then under 300, you start to see eh, a little bit of difference, 6.6 .6 versus 7.5 on the drops. Call it a wash. Nine inches of deflection instead of 9.5. Really, you're still right in there. 1397 on your foot pounds. Just a great, effective hunting cartridge out to 300 yards. I would say that's more than valid for any deer in North America, including moose. Um, that, as I said earlier, the Canadians use this a lot, and they claim it works really, really well on moose. And you can pretty much depend on the quality of the rifle. This would have been the Lee Enfield or the SMLE uh, rifles from the war. And as I think I mentioned earlier, our manufacturers built a lot of those rifles for the war effort. We would build, build them, I think, by Winchester and maybe even Remington, some of the others. We actually made those British rifles over here. So got a good history behind it. Now we go to the 857 Mauser, and this is highly respected around the world and used around the world, similarly to the 30 6 You're shooting 180 grain bullet in this one because, remember, this is a 32 caliber. And if we can shoot a 180 grain in the 30 6 we can certainly shoot it in this guy. I don't know if you want to go up to the 200s, but you could. 200 grain bullets and heavier, but this is kind of what a deer hunter and even an elk hunter would pick is a 180 grain bullet in that. So you're going to lose a little bit to your BC there because of the wider bullet at that weight. 0.394 on a BC, 2,650 feet per second from the muzzle. Gives you good energy at 2,807. You can see that one is the highest energy so far. Quite a bit more recoil, 25.6 foot-pounds out of that 7-pound rifle. Maximum point-blank range, just hanging right in there with the rest of these at 265 yards. So you can see you're starting off pretty nice at 100 yards and not much uh, difference from the rest of these. At 200 yards, they're just all right in there. 3.8 inches, 4 inches on the 303 British. Tie game, you just have more energy. And then out there at 700 yards, a little more drop than the 303 British has. A uh, little less deflection of the bullet, 8.8 instead of 9, but who's going to notice two tenths? And then, again, more energy, about 200, a little more than 200 foot-pounds, more energy in that bigger bullet. Suitable for elk? Absolutely. Out to 300 yards, you've got yourself a good little elk cartridge. And I don't know that you bump into very many hunters out there who say, oh, I'm getting me an 8 by 57 to go elk hunting. <laughs> But a lot of our grandfathers did this coming back from the wars. They would have captured Mausers, which is an outstandingly strong functional rifle, good bolt action rifle, a little bit heavy in its military format. But they would do is they would customize them, cut down the stock, lighten things up a little bit and make a sporting rifle out of it. And they were quite popular. Um, and a lot of them would neck that down to the 308 cartridge um, or... More popularly, they would take a 308 and they would neck it up to take the 8mm bullets because they had the bore already there for the 323 bullet and they had a 8mm OT6 and that was pretty popular as an inexpensive homemade rifle in the middle of the 20th century. Now we get to the champ here, the 30 OT6. I hate to be bragging, guys, but the numbers don't lie. <laughs> We're looking at a pretty hefty little cartridge here. Now, I've stuck with a 168 grain bullet because to me that pretty much optimizes the potential performance of the 30 out 6. You can drive that thing 2,950 feet per second with modern rifles, fully loaded bolt action rifle, really strong. Get your bullet BC up there pretty high, 0.525. 
Muzzle energy, 3,247 foot-pounds. Yeah, you pay for it on the shoulder, 27 uh, foot-pounds of recoil energy. Maximum point-blank range, the best of all of these, 300 yards. Uh, and you can see by the numbers we're going to look at, this guy is the winner. At 300 yards, you just have 3.2 inches of drop, only 5.5 inches of wind deflection. That's nice. And you're retaining over 2,000 foot-pounds of energy, 2,209, which is why you're probably taking that 30 out 6 as a hunting cartridge easily past 400 yards. And I don't doubt that you could do 600. The military had this thing calibrated to shoot 1,000 yards. The sights on the rifles were actually adjusted for that. So it's got a lot of reach. and so a lot of power. It's just no wonder it's such a do-it-all popular, successful around the world hunting cartridge. Go ahead and call it a military cartridge if you want, but it's one of the best hunting cartridges ever devised. Now there are two more out here I don't have samples of, but these were our allies and those are the Russians in World War II. They started off shooting the seven by 62 by 53 Russian cartridge that actually shot a more or less 0.311 inch diameter bullet, same as the 303 British. But there were a lot of sloppy bores out there. They claim they went as high as 312 in the bore and down as tight as 308. So if you try loading them up these days, it gets a little bit tricky. A lot of guys will try loading them up with a standard 308 bullet and get really lousy accuracy because the bore is a lot looser than that. You're just not getting a good tight fit. But at any rate, if you find one that works for you, and as I say, get a gunsmith to check this thing out, because quite a few of them came back, or not back, but came over. 150 grain bullet, uh, the BC at 3 point, uh, 0.361, 2,800 feet per second, not too shabby. Good muzzle energy at 2,612. 20.3 foot-pounds of recoil energy, 270 yards. You can see all these military rounds were pretty much given the same maximum point-blank range. And at 300 yards, you've got 5.9 inches of drop, not too bad, 9 inches of wind deflection. It's just hanging in there with the Brit and the 7.7 .7 Arasaka. 1,456 uh, foot-pounds of energy. So if you happen to find an old Russian Mosin Nagant chambered for that 7.62 by 53, and make sure you know which one this is, because we got another one coming up. This is the long one, the 53. You've got yourself a pretty darn good deer and or elk rifle out to about 300 yards. If you can get it to shoot straight, you've got, you might even have to slug the barrel just to figure out exactly what the diameter of it is. Speaking of the Mosin Nagant, <laughs> this uh, 7 by 62 by 53 Russian cartridge, I once actually hunted with that in the former Soviet Union. I was on a hunt in Kyrgyzstan and the airline saw fit to leave my rifle behind. <laughs> Does this ever happen? So there I am in camp, up in the mountains in Kyrgyzstan, chomping at the bit, going for ibex in the high country. We were up about 13,000 feet. We went as high as 14,000. That's nosebleed stuff for me. <laughs> but I didn't have a rifle. So the uh, guides were a couple of Russians who stayed in Kyrgyzstan after their war service or whatever they were doing there. Um, but they were blonde Russians and just as friendly and happy. And boy, they were good hunters, good outdoorsmen, tough. But they said, use this, Mosin the gun, good rifle. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. It's a big clunky military rifle with an old military scope hanging off the side on a side mount. <laughs> An unfamiliar cartridge to me, and I, I I don't know what this thing is, but oh, he's good. I say, how high should I aim for, say, a 300-yard shot? Because up in these mountains, you're probably looking at a fairly long shot. No, no hide. Aim straight dead on. Shoots flat all the way to 700 yards. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so I took some uh, target shots and we'll get it figured out. They didn't want me shooting up all their ammo with extensive practice, but I just made sure it was zeroed properly and got a rough idea of my drops at 300 and tried to extrapolate from there. But oh my gosh, fortunately, I did not have to shoot anything with it because before I found a target, an animal to shoot after the second day, my rifle arrived and I got to hunt with an, a real American rifle in 270 WSM. And that's what I got my, my animal with. But little side story I thought you might enjoy.
All right, then the final one in the war was the 7.62 by 39 Russian, and that's the one we all know is that short little rim thing these days. That's probably more famous, well, maybe not, but I think ballistically it's more famous as the PPC cartridges, the, uh, oh, what were those two guys' names? Paisamo and Pindell, I can't remember. But at any rate, in the 19, late 1970s, early 80s, these uh, target shooters, precision shooters, came up with these based on the 220 Russian cartridge, which came from this uh, 7.62, if I remember it correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's where it came from. Those became really popular as they were some of the first short, fat target cartridges. But I think these days with the... Um, SKS rifles and then the AK-47 style auto-loading rifles that are fairly popular. That's what they're shooting. And they generally will shoot 120 to 129 grain bullets. 123 was kind of the standard. You can find those and there's a lot of reloading data for that stuff. So let's go with 123 grain bullet. Pretty low BC at 310. Muzzle velocity is not all that high either at 2400. Muzzle energy is just 1573, not much recoil, 8.6 foot-pounds in a, in a 7-pound rifle. And the maximum point-blank range is only 230 yards. This is sort of the change that's come in military rounds here in recent years, starting after World War II when we realized we were probably all shooting bigger, heavier rounds than we needed to. So everybody started cutting down. And of course, we went to the 5.56 and a little 22 caliber, and the Russians went to this one. Um, so this explains a little bit about what's going on with the lower velocities. I do not think very many of these were used in the war because they didn't make the cartridge until 43. I think that's when the AK-47 came out, um, but not that many of them actually got into the war. They were still pretty much cranking out those Mosin Nagant bolt actions. But you look at the performance of this, and it's eh, pretty pretty puny. 300 yards, 13 inches of drop, 13 inches of deflection in the wind, and only 753 foot-pounds of energy remaining. I mean, you're falling under 1,000 foot-pounds of energy already at 200 yards when you're down to 973. So I thought I had a sample of that cartridge, but I could not find it in my collection here. So I think most of you can look it up and figure it all out. But Interesting what happened with those 20th century cartridges. Yeah, this one is really famous. I talk about it a lot because it sort of started the whole program. And you started with that, then you got the 757 Mauser, and then the 30 out 6 was sort of borrowed the sizes from those two and the basic ideas. It's where the first rimless cartridge came from. Then the first sharp spire point bullets came from the Germans, and they really set the bar. The Brits, of course, a little bit further behind in the technology of the cartridge design, but because they were so widespread around the world, that thing really did yeoman's duty for a lot of years. Uh, the Japanese cartridge pretty quickly went away, but along with the other 6.5 military rounds, it sort of set the the standard for bringing in a lot of the 6.5s that have finally caught on here in the 21st century, which seems a little bit odd since this one, the uh, Swedish military cartridge, the 6.5 by 55 Swede, my gosh, that thing was doing what the Creedmoor does now way back in 1892 or 4 when that thing came out. But uh, as I said, there are just a lot of the European countries that were using the 6.5 in their military weapons back then. And then they went to the wider ones and the bigger ones, and now we're going back down to the narrower ones again. So things change, but any and all of these can be used for hunting. It's just kind of a silly notion to think that because it's designed for military use, that's the only thing it can be used for. You just be pragmatic and practical about these things because all we're doing with these cartridges is driving a projectile that is used to take the animal. And as long as you have the tools to get the bullet there, it's the bullet that's doing all of the work. So spend a lot more time thinking about your bullets than your cartridges. I know even I, I end up talking about cartridges and cartridges and rifles and not as much about the bullets, but these are just the launch pads for the bullet. So do keep that in mind. So if you find an old military rifle or a sporterized version of it, something that came out of the 20th century, do get it checked out for safety before you use it. And then keep your loads low don't take any chances with it, but you don't hesitate to use some of those old 20th century military cartridges as a modern hunting round because, by golly, they've got what it takes to do the job. 
This is Ron Spomer. Thanks for listening in. We'll see you next time on Honest and Shoot Straight. (laughs) 